Okay, so let's get back to uh, practice test one for the SATs. So we are on passage number two, which is questions 11 through 21. Um, and it's about shopping, essentially. So we're going to start with question 11. So obviously, you know, when you get something like this, I like to have a quick look through. You don't need to do a deep dive. You don't need to analyze anything. Just kind of get your bearings on where we are. The authors most likely use the examples in lines one through nine of the passage to highlight something. So let's have a look. Every day, millions of shoppers hit the stores in full force, blah, blah, blah. We're looking for every, from every to showers. So we are, I mean, it is the whole thing, but we're trying to look for those specific events that they're referring to. Um, examples. So aside from purchasing holiday gifts, most people regularly buy presents for other occasions throughout the year, including weddings, birthdays, anniversaries, graduations, and baby showers. Cool. This highlights A, the regularity with which people shop for gifts. B, the recent increase in amount of money spent on gifts, C, anxiety gift shopping causes for consumers, or D, number of special occasions involving gift giving. So I think we can kind of confidently say that the answer is A, but we can keep uh, looking at the options if we so need to. B, the increase in amount of money spent on gifts. This has nothing to do with cost. There's no mention of money here. Um, anxi anxiety gift shopping causes for consumers. I mean, I guess... Like you could make the argument that like these occasions could give you anxiety, but it's not an inherent part of this passage and it's not relevant. In line 10, the word ambivalent most nearly means blah, 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 blah. You can do these types of questions in multiple ways. Uh, one of the ways that I've learned is to find the sentence and then not even look at the options and just try and put in your own word. So line 10, uh, this frequent experience of gift giving can engender ambivalent feelings in gift givers. If that sentence alone doesn't give you much of a hint, keep reading and it might provide some context clues. Many relish the opportunity to buy presents because gift giving offers a powerful means to build stronger bonds with one's closest peers. At the same time, many dread the thought of buying gifts. They worry that their purchases will disappoint rather than delight the intended recipients. So through this through the context clues that they've given us, right, they tell us that a lot of people are excited, but they're also nervous. If you look at the answers, the answer choices that were given, we've got unrealistic, conflicted, apprehensive, and supportive. So the one I most closely went for was conflicted. I think I actually did say the word conflict. But if we look at the other options, we can see unrealistic, that doesn't make sense. It can engender unrealistic feelings in gift givers. I think anxiety and also, you know, excitement are very realistic feelings. Uh, apprehensive, you can make an argument for like the anxiety of gift giving is apprehensive, but that's not as relevant to the answer as the conflict is, right? Because it says nothing about the positive feelings that come with gift giving. And then supportive is kind of the other side of that. Like it doesn't really mention anything about being supportive. So you could interpret the positive feelings as being supportive, but it says nothing about the worry that people have that the recipients might not like their gifts. So the answer is B. 13. The authors indicate that people value gift giving because they feel it functions as a form of self-expression, is an inexpensive way to show appreciation, appreciation, requires the gift recipient to reciprocate or conserve to strengthen a relationship. Looking through here, it says so in the first paragraph. So remember how the SAT in terms of questions and answers does tend to move chronologically. So you can kind of assume that the answer that they're looking for is found in the sort of first section of of the paper. Many relish the opportunity to buy presents because gift giving offers a powerful means to build bond, to build stronger bonds with one's closest peers. So in that same paragraph that we talked about, the ambivalent feelings, we've also got this, the positive feelings, right? The positive feelings that go along with gift giving is because it could help build a stronger relationship with uh, peers. So in 13, question 13, the answer, as we can see it, is right there, right? It can serve to strengthen a relationship. And for questions like this, don't overthink your like don't overthink it. Mark it off and keep going. There's no use second guessing yourself if you think you're pretty sure of an answer. Like we have plenty of questions in the SAT. No need to get hung up on something that we kind of think we already know. And then we've got one of the evidence questions. So, which choice provides the best evidence for the answer to the previous question? I already cited one of these options, which is A lines 10 to 13 as being the thing that tipped me off. So we can kind of assume that the answer is A. You can look through the other answers if you are unsure. So we've got lines 22 to 24. People buy gifts that recipients would not choose to buy on their own. Irrelevant. 
uh, research and perspectives. Research has found that people often struggle to take account of others' perspectives. No. And then although, although a link between gift price and feelings of appreciation might seem intuitive to gift givers, such an assumption may be unfounded. Again, does not provide evidence for people valuing gift giving because they feel like it strengthens a relationship. So the answer is A. The social psychologists mentioned in paragraph two would likely describe the deadweight loss phenomenon as something. Let's have a look. We have lines 17 through 34. That's the paragraph. Gift giving presents an objective waste of resources. People buy gifts that recipients would not choose to buy on their own, or at least not spend as much money to purchase, a phenomenon referred to as the deadweight loss of Christmas. To wit, givers are likely to spend $100 to purchase a gift that receivers would spend only $80 to buy themselves. This deadweight loss, I'm going to highlight that again because it's relevant, suggests that gift givers are not very good at predicting what gifts others will appreciate. That in itself is not surprising to uh -huh -huh, social psychologists that are mentioned in the question. Um, so research has found the research of the social psychologists, has found that people often struggle to take account of others' perspectives. Their insights are subject to egocentrism, social protection, and multiple, multiple attribution errors. Looking at what we've seen here, we obviously can tell that this is not a positive, they don't view this phenomenon in a positive light. Let's have a look. Predictable? Yeah. Yeah, this is a predictable phenomenon. That's why they are able to sort of make it a phenomenon, right? Is it's predictable. So that in itself is not surprising. So I think we can kind of confidently say that the answer is A, but we can keep uh, looking at the options if we so need to. So questionable, That's there's nothing in there about, about that, and that seems like a kind of irrelevant answer choice. There's nothing questionable about it. It happens. Uh, disturbing, like it's not a great thing, but it it's not disturbing. There's no, like, disturbing kind of implies like a surprise shock value type situation, which is not the case here. So no. Nope. And then unprecedented? No. It's very precedented. It happens at Christmas. <laughs> Question 16. The passage indicates that the assumption made by gift givers in lines 41 to 44 may be something. Okay, what are the assumptions? Uh, the gift givers equate how much they spend with how much recipients will appreciate the gift. The more expensive the gift, the stronger a gift recipient's feelings of appreciation. Although a link between gift price and feelings of appreciation, okay, that's irrelevant. So gift givers equate how much they spend with how much recipients will appreciate the gift. The more expensive the gift, the stronger a gift recipient's feels of feelings of appreciation. This assumption, the passage totally goes on to kind of debunk that, right? So it says, although a link between gift price and feelings of appreciation might seem intuitive to gift givers, and this is important, such an assumption may be unfounded. Indeed, we propose that gift recipients will be less inclined to base their feelings of appreciation on the magnitude of a gift than givers assume. So we know from this that gift givers make this assumption that you spend more money on a gift and they will like it more. And research has proven, well, actually it doesn't say necessarily research, but this assumption seems to be unfounded. So looking here, insincere. This assumption is insincere. I wouldn't say that because it's a genuine assumption that's made by, by the gift givers. So we can cross that off. Unreasonable? I wouldn't say it's unreasonable. There's, you know, the seeming implication is that, like, I would appreciate more if you bought me a house than if you bought me a paperclip, and that's due to the monetary value, right? So it's not unreasonable. Is it incorrect? Yes, it's unfounded. So there we go. And it's substantiated, that's like kind of the opposite. It, it is unfounded, so we can cross that off. And then which answer provides the best evidence for the answer to the, uh, for, for the, answer to the previous question? Perhaps givers believe that bigger, i.e. more expensive gifts can can convey stronger signals of thoughtfulness and consideration. That's just about the assumption that has nothing to do with whether or not it's unfounded. Lines 55 to 60. According to Camerer, Camerer? I don't know, and others, Gift giving represents a symbolic ritual whereby gift givers attempt to signal their positive attitudes towards the intended recipient and their willingness to invest resources in a future relationship. Again, we're just talking about the assumptions here. We're not talking about whether they're incorrect or not. Uh, 63. As for gift recipients, they may not construe smaller and larger gifts as representing smaller and larger signals of thoughtfulness and consideration. That seems quite relevant. 
this is how the gift recipients think, uh, and it counters the assumption that's been made. Let's look at the last one. In theoretical terms, people fail to utilize information about their own preferences and experiences in order to produce more efficient outcomes in their exchange relations. Not what we're talking about. In essence, um, yeah, it's not what we're talking about. So the answer is C. And like, especially they'll use, the SAT might use examples like D um, with quite intense words and whatever, like people in theoretical terms, people fail to utilize information about their own preferences and experiences in order to produce more efficient outcomes in their exchange relations. You have to look beyond the words that they're throwing at you and, and say like, people don't really use the information about what they like to make gifts better for the other person which is great, but it has nothing to do with the assumption about that gift givers think that more expensive gifts lead to higher appreciation. As it is used in line 54, convey most nearly means something. All right, let's have a look. Perhaps gi givers believe that bigger, I'm gonna highlight this actually. Uh, perhaps givers believe that bigger, i.e. more expensive gifts, convey stronger signals of thoughtfulness and consideration. My highlighting always just devolves into scribbles. Gifts convey stronger signals of thoughtfulness and consideration. I would put something in there like they express, like they communicate, they do something like that. And if we have a look at the answer choices, we have communicate, oh my gosh, which is great. Okay, next question. The authors refer to work by camera, 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 someone, and others uh, in order to do something. So according to Camera and others, gift giving represents a symbolic ritual whereby gift givers attempt to signal their positive attitudes towards the intended recipient and their willingness to invest resources in a future relationship. So what are they saying here? They're explaining the process of gift giving uh, it, and what it represents to people. So if we look at our answers, offer an explanation. Yeah, that's what they're doing. They're explaining the symbolic meaning of gift giving. They are not introducing an argument because there's no like side to the argument. So it can't be that. Uh, they're not questioning a motive because there are no questions. <laughs> and then they are not supporting a conclusion because no conclusion has really been made through that, through that explanation, right? What they are doing is telling you what this is. They're not, again, trying to argue a point. 20. Graph questions. Now, graph questions should be some of the easiest questions on the reading sections because the answers truly are right there. The graph following the passage offers evidence that gift givers will base their predictions of how much a gift will be appreciated on. So let's have a look at the graph. So we have gift givers perceived and uh, gift recipients actual gift appreciations. Down here at the bottom, we have giver and recipient. Um, so these are for the givers, these are for the recipients. The key is coded as the dark one is the less expensive gift, and then the light one is the more expensive gift. And we have the mean appreciation. I don't know how they're measuring this. I guess it's just like on a scale of zero to seven, but whatever, irrelevant. We don't really need to know. What we need to know is gift givers will base their predictions of how much a gift will be appreciated based on something. And from what it says on the graph, it seems that the gift giver perceives that someone's going to appreciate the gift more if it's more expensive. So it has nothing to do with the, with, uh, so if we look at the answers, it has nothing to do with A, because that's kind of just talking about the question, right? Like a gift can't be appreciated based on the appreciation level of the recipients. That doesn't make sense. Uh, the monetary value of the gift, that's where it's at. It's right there. And what's nice is that we have also been talking about this throughout the passage. So it kind of makes sense that it just backs up the, the argument. Argument. C, their own desires for the gifts they purchase, that has is nowhere on the graph. And then their relationship with the gift recipients is also nowhere on the graph. Just by looking at the graph, like you don't even you don't need to analyze the data or anything like that. You just know it's based on the amount of money spent on the gift. All right. The authors would likely attribute the differences in gift giver and recipient mean appreciation as represented in the graph to an ability, so we got A, an ability to shift perspective. Well, yeah, if we look at the passage, people fail to utilize information about their own preferences and experiences in order to produce more efficient outcomes in their exchange relations. The differences in these appreciations is because the gift giver can't 
shift their perspective, right? They can't look outside themselves and take into account other people's preferences. So I would argue that the answer is A. And it's not a, an increasingly materialistic culture because that isn't really discussed. Um, that's not the purpose of the passage, right? It's to talk about how gift givers and gift receivers perceive their gifts. And then it's not a growing opposition to gift giving because, you know, we talk about how it's a billion dollar industry and then a misunderstanding of intentions. Intentions don't have a lot to do with how people receive a gift unless it's like, I don't know, a backhanded gift. I don't know if those things exist, but basically the difference in the graph is due to an inability of the gift giver to be able to shift their perspective and look at things uh, regardless of monetary value because the recipient often doesn't know the monetary value of a gift. So that's uh, passage two.